The Introvert's Edge podcast was designed to create a dialogue around introversion, to stimulate a discussion around our disadvantages, how we overcome those disadvantages, and what we consider our introvert's edge. Together, we're finally going to confront the stigma around introversion, showing that we're not second-class citizens. We're just different, and we need to embrace that. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Introverts Edge and I'm excited to welcome back Jamie Masters who's given some amazing value in the first episode and we're just about to get into talking about her unbelievable way of moderating a panel. Jamie, so glad to have you back. Thank you so much. I sat here the whole time. No. You did. <laughs> you, you didn't have to drive anywhere. So great. Thank you. Oh, such a long way. Well, we talk about batching and how it's important, right? You're number two on my list of nine more interviews today and it, we just do them back to back. So. Smart man. But I'm happy to have you in the morning when I'm still energetic and because I have to keep up with your energy level. You're always so energetic. That's why I didn't believe you were an introvert. Good so, segue, good segue. That's, like it. That. that's <laughs> it. So that was my special segue back yes. into, so as an introvert, I've seen you moderate panels and I've always been really impressed. And when I thought you were an extrovert, I'm like, well, I'm never going to be able to do that. But now I'm really excited about finding out about how you do that because every time I see you moderate a panel, it's so engaging. Everybody gives you answers that are a lot deeper than I've seen in a lot. Like a lot of people are always worried about the time and they answer the question differently to what the person's asking. And you seem to just run it really, really well. So is that something that you just naturally did or is, did it come from the learning of public speaking or do you have a, a systematic process for doing that? All of those things. So one, I think, um, on sales. So when I started getting really good at finding the pain in sales, you're like asking more deeper, deeper, deeper questions so that way you can really get to the main point. That was really helpful when I started interviewing millionaires because when I interviewed them, I literally at the very beginning would just have a list of questions not actually listen to anything that they said and then just find my next question and then be like okay so next well none of it made any like it was, they were horrible they were really really bad and so I did tons of research on trying to be a better interviewer to begin with right and read all the books figured out all of this stuff and and a lot of people said don't get to know your person too much because your audience doesn't know them. And I'm like, perfect, now I don't have to do all the research work. Yay, this is great. Uh, but it's really, really helped because when I really start to listen to what they actually say, and I'm a coach, right? So I learned all these active listening skills, but as soon as I either interviewed or did a panel or something like that, I would shut it off. I'd be like, yeah. what's next? Because I have to be paying attention to all the other things. Um, but doing webinars online has really helped for this, doing online stuff where you really had to pay attention and go a little bit deeper. So I do have a system. Okay, so part of it is, again, not knowing too, too much about the guests in general. Um, but when I go through, I try and figure out from the audience perspective what they actually care about. So definitely go back through and try and figure out who's in the audience. I mean, this is 101 stuff, but who's in, who's in the audience? So that way I can tailor whatever questions. I don't write any questions down in advance, really, unless they ask for it. So when I moderate a panel, a lot of them ask for it. It's kind of, I'm like, come on, just trust me, right? Um, I'm Jamie Masters. I, Why don't you just trust I me to do that? I will take care of you people, but I'm sure I've been moderated on really horrible panels. So I'm like, oh gosh, no, you should, that's a horrible question. I should have prepped for that, right? So I totally understand. So I give sample questions most of the time, but my tactics are to get to know them way beforehand. So at your event, I tried to meet all of them beforehand and ask a bunch of questions and know about their kids and create rapport before we get on stage because if, if I don't know them and we don't, yep. you won't have that, right? So even with my interviews, I try and like, I only have a short sp span of time beforehand and I've, I've gotten really good at being able to connect uh, different dots, try and figure out so that way they can feel comfortable because when they don't and at, at the beginning and they're like stiff, it's not good. Yeah. So on the panel side, I do that. We come up with specific sample questions, but mostly I'm asking, oh, tell me more. Like I literally have these words that I say, oh, why is that? Oh, tell me more, right? Just So you're the therapist on the couch. <laughs> Seriously, right? that's all I do. Let me just keep asking questions. Um, I, I have a couple go-to that I, that I really, really go to when I have no idea what I'm gonna say. Uh, because, I mean, you even saw me when I was interviewing you here. I have this, it's literally a bunch of chicken scratch and scribbles and I write like one or two words as you say she something. She writes like a doctor. <laughs> I mean, so. I'm, a, I'm an artist, don't even. Voted most artistic, that's what it is. Um, but, when, but when you look at what I'm actually trying to pay attention to, I'm actually trying to listen to what you say. And I'm writing a key point down so that I can remember that one key point point. Um, and then I, uh, and this is just something that I got better at, I think, with practice, is remembering the thread 
because as you listen to anybody, whether it be on a panel or in an interview, they will go on so many gosh darn tangents. And, and sometimes you're like, oh, can't ask that question again. He just went over here. Crap, can't ask that one now, right? So I, I keep coming up with questions as if I'm just a curious person going, oh, that's really interesting. Ooh, that's something that I would really want to know if I was in the audience perspective. Um, and paying attention to those questions and then writing like a little thing so I'll remember it so I can actually pay attention to you and, and engage with you instead of being like, and next I have the thing that I'm supposed to do, right? Yeah, yeah. so don't go off topic. I've got to ask this question next. Please don't make it a discussion. Okay, but, but you know that it happens, right? So, so that's when I go, oh, tell me more. <laughs> like, oh, I don't know. I have nothing to say here. You, you changed it completely. Yeah. And now I don't have enough time to come up with a different question in my head. So literally that's where I just go to those. And it's just doing it and going with the f a flow. I, I used to be so rigid um, in going, well this, is the, well, this is what I want to get out of it in advance. And what I've realized is I don't know what people are going to get. When I, I've done shows where I'm like, oh, I don't think that was very good. And people will write emails to me, that was the best show you've ever done. And I'm like, okay, I thought they were saying like general generic information that wasn't really helpful to people. And sometimes simplicity is key, right? I, my most shared article on Entrepreneur is the one where I went, well, I kind of phoned that one in. So I think that a lot of times we're trying to ask those deep, deep questions. And a lot of the people that are listening to us are actually just starting in their journey. You've interviewed me twice now on your introverted, um, sorry, eventual millionaire, not My introverted new shoe's millionaire called podcast. The <laughs> <laughs> Did you know her podcast is called The Introverted <laughs> Millionaire? No, on The Eventual Millionaire. And both times, and I'm not sure if this is just because we're friends and, you know, we, we have a great rapport, but by the time we get on the show, we've already been laughing and we're joking and we're having a good time. And I've, I've looked at some of the energy that you have with some of your other guests. And mm -hmm. I can understand how you do that when you're moderating a panel because you're in and around their space. But if you're just going on an interview for the first time as a guest or going or, or having a podcast and, and interviewing someone for the first time, how do you just strike up that, that rapport and get laughing and joking so that that energy is there? Because I'm an evil, no, so th this is the thing. That's my, that has been my goal in life to try and get better at that piece because I, I this is going to make you feel not very special, but I do that with everyone, <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> But not yeah. exactly the same, yeah. right? No, I, you're <laughs> special, Snowflake. It's fine. No, but, but what's funny is, like I was saying right before, like that amount of time, because most of the time I don't know them. And maybe I've gotten an introduction for somebody coming on my show. But it is. It's a very different thing to be able to see somebody in person versus literally we start the interview. And I usually do eight back-to-back -back or seven sometimes. Um, and I have to keep up my energy through the entire thing. And I make them at the end. I go, I, I dare you to guess which one's my last, which one's most my last one. You won't be able to guess, right? Um, because every single time I get in the flow and I just want to have as much fun as humanly possible. So if I find those connection threads like I was talking about beforehand, I go through, I have like a little shtick that I do before my interviews anyway. Um, like, oh, this is going to be about 30, 45 minutes. Is that still okay with you? Yes. Okay, great. Buy in. They shake their head. Great. Um, so I go through the things. I tell them about the last question. And I try and joke with them at the very beginning anyway. We're going to shoot straight through. If you say stupid stuff, we like that, right? Like yeah. things, and it's a shtick because I've said it so many times before. And it's funny, on us, you know, doing seven back to back. I've said it that many times. But of course, they don't know. And they're, they're hearing it. And they see how relaxed I am. And they feel better because I've been on shows where it's really awkward. Sometimes the interviewer isn't very good. And you're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Right, And so the goal is to really have that rapport before you actually get on the show. So that way they're like, she's going to take care of me. I, and that's what I usually tell them. I'm like, I ask you questions, you answer them, it's going to be fun, we're going we're gonna to roll with it. Right? And they're like, okay, thank you. And then as we're going through, I try and find connection threads through the entire interview. Because my goal, yes, help my audience. My goal is to be friends with them, literally. Like, yeah. I just need more friends, apparently. Um, but we'll bring up something, and I'll be like, oh, I love UFC, blah, blah, blah. I was just watching it up here. And, and then the other person will be like, oh, I love that too, right? And then we go on a little bit of a tangent, and I have to swing it back around. But either way, it's really trying to build that rapport, but not like, oh, I live there too, yay, right? There's like some really crappy rapport, and there's joking and having fun and actually enjoying yourself versus business rapport. Does that make sense? What advice would you give somebody that's, I'm just imagining an introvert going, okay, so I've got to come up with these things that aren't scripted rapport. Yeah. 
What would you say, how, how would somebody start that journey? Because yours didn't happen by accident. You practiced and practiced and practiced. Did, was there a book that you read where it just made sense or a, a way that you started practicing where you got better at this? Well, what's funny is I was married formerly to a comedian, so that is very helpful, okay? So I'd be like, they're not very funny. I can be more funny. Than no. Uh, so it, it was, I would write things down. I would practice it. So I needed it scripted at least at the beginning. And whenever I'd say something and they laugh, I'd write it down. Like I literally, at the very, very beginning when I first started doing it, because I was so awkward, I apparently said the word excellent 17 times on the first time I did the thing because yep. I couldn't know what to say. I was like, excellent. <laughs> that does not create rapport at all. <laughs> so uh, and it was sad. So I changed words also. I'd say excellent. And then I was like, oh, wow, a bazillion times in a row. So I People are like, this person's not listening to me. <laughs> I was so bad. My mentor made me, because he listened to one of them, and he was like, did you notice? How I and I was like, I suck at this. I shouldn't do this anymore. Uh, he, I made a list of other words to say during the interview <laughs> that weren't the word excellent. Like, literally, oh, that's interesting. Like, a whole bunch of words. It was there on my desk forever. Because I kept going, I felt like I was preconditioned to just... <gasps> When I choke, I don't know what to do. And so what I ended up doing was writing down the ones that actually felt comfortable. Because there's words, especially when you're doing something like this. I had that big old list. I'd say one of the words and be like, that sounded really awkward, right? So I'd like cross that one out because that one was really bad. And so I just got better and better and better at that. So the beginning piece, the shtick, just evolved over many of them. And at the beginning, me being really, really bad, and then me making a joke, and then remembering that joke. So and just perfecting over the time. process. Yeah, I know, and, and I wish it was like, oh, just say these things. Well, I think that's important for people to know, though, because people say, oh, you know, I'll read this book and then I'll try it, and if I'm, it doesn't instantly change, then I, I'm clearly not supposed to be doing it. And I think you made it very clear that's that's not the case. It's I literally wrote down words to try and learn how to do this stuff. And that sounds like a lot of work. It sounds uncomfortable. It sounds robotic, but it evolved into who you are now. And, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I have a, uh, a guy that helped me launch my Rapid Growth Academy. And when we were looking for the person that was going to interview me on that, I gave him all of the interviews that I've done. And it's nearly 100 interviews. He's like, that Jamie Masters girl, you get her to interview you because she's just such a relaxed interviewer and she she focuses on the guest, not herself, and she projects their amazingness. And I, Do you I think know you why? did that well. Because I was told that I talked too much at the first time. <laughs> so. Might have been told that myself. <laughs> so, but, yeah. uh, but that's the thing, it's the evolutionary process, right? And what's so funny is I've interviewed so many people and they're like, oh, this person, their assistant will be like, he's never had that rapport with anyone. You're, and I'm like, I'm amazing, mostly because I learned, right? Yeah. Because I literally podcast comments, like she laughs, she laughs too much, because I used to laugh, I mean, I laugh too much now anyway, but now it's because it's, I'm having fun, not because I was awkwardly laughing before, right? Or just having, or just having horrible no words for left for me like that, right? No words. I'd be like, and I'm just going to keep talking because I don't know what question to ask. It was, it was horrible. And what I learned is to shut up, actually listen. Yeah. Right? This is not rocket science here, but it's so crazy to know. It's not rocket science. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Product placement. <laughs> yes, good job. Uh, but it, it is an evolutionary process. And to me, what you were saying, people will say it's too hard. To me, it's the commitment to the end result that matters. So no matter what, I will get to this result. If it takes me two years, that's okay. And if it takes me shorter time, that would be much better. But it's the commitment to what you want. Anybody, I really feel like anybody pretty much can do anything if they are committed enough to it. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't change, you know, I can change my hair color, but not much else. But wh when it comes to you and the personal growth and evolution of you as a human, to go from, you know, when I was the most awkward teenager in the entire world to being able to go, ah, oh, everyone's like, you, you're a natural. I'm like, yes. I remember going on stage with uh, with my mom, like had a friend growing up, and they had a big, huge networking group, and I got asked to speak on stage. And this woman kind of came up afterwards. She was a friend of my mom's, and she's like, "I remember changing your diapers." It's like, "Thanks, awesome, <laughs> appreciate that." Um, but she goes, "You were never the person I would ever imagine being on stage ever." She said that I was in the corner reading a book. Like when people would come over for dinner, I would go away because I didn't like that. So she was amazed, but I just really, really wanted to do it anyway. And once I got over the redness thing and was like, fine, I'm gonna tell this story later about how bad it sucked before, that was my commitment. And you can make it happen. 
I think one of the things that was really interesting about the way you do your podcast, where you do you know seven or eight in a row, and you know I've got like I think ten interviews today, and I had ten interviews yesterday. I'm batching the entire series into three days, and I do that because it allows me to keep my flow. And you batch yours as well. A lot of people are like oh, I could never do that as an introvert. I'm I'm exhausted after one conversation. Talk to me about why you batch what you do. That's a great question because I have children and I only work so much. <laughs> no, I well number one is is flow. It's really helpful. I, I try and batch my sales calls if I can. All like wherever the the mindset I need to be in is is helpful. But I literally will go curl up in a ball after those days. I can't do anything. I can maybe watch a movie and that's about it. Um, in between, I try and do little meditation breaks as best I can, even if it's five minutes, to just be like. I'm a zombie. Okay, great. And then, and then when I when the I have the other person there and I can feed off their energy for a while, yeah. I'd be like, okay, I got this. Um, and when I'm in flow, we have more energy. We just do a better job. And then, yes, you, I feel like crap in between. <laughs> Well, I think you do a great job of managing your energy, though. Actually, Chris, who's recording this, walked in on you doing your meditation in the middle of a, um, in the middle of one of your retreats that you do, and you know you try and find times to recharge. Mm. As as introverts, you know I'm one of those people that has to stare at. I don't watch the TV. I just stare at a TV going with nothing else going on in a dark room to do my recharge. But you kind of discovered meditation. To, to recharge for yourself. You just spend a couple of minutes just explaining why that works so well for you. Because a lot of people kind of like, that's kind of woo-woo, Jamie. Okay, so number one, after interviewing this many millionaires and them talking about meditation so much, I have, la I have lessened the woo-woo stance of it for sure. Because science now backs it up like all crazy. I started it because I had kids and I thought I was going to go crazy. Like, so oh, many, ah, they both had colic really, really bad. So that was one reason why I actually started it. Yeah. What's crazy is I recommend it to my clients all the time now because I call it entrepreneur crazy brain. I really feel like small business owners, we are thinking about everything all at once, right? And so it, it's, it's crazy to live in our brains for a while. And I don't think most people understand how crazy it can be. Not even if you have ADD, which I do have, but not even that. Us trying to solve every problem for everyone, that's what we do as a business owner. And I had to stop it. I could not, I couldn't survive because my energy would just, by the end of the day, I couldn't, it was horrible. <laughs> like I eat, and then I couldn't sleep when I actually tried. So meditation started as like a, if I could just sit for five minutes and try, I'd actually end up falling asleep a lot because I had small children and didn't sleep very much. Uh, but that was the very beginning. Now, especially with like my clients, I suggest headspace or doing something because if we can manage what we're thinking, because you can, even though you don't think you can right now, most people are like, meditation, woo woo, crazy. I can't, that's not for me. Yeah. I'm one of those people that was like, that's not for me. And it has changed my life. Just in knowing like what actually comes up yeah. and what's a belief versus a, or a trigger or when I'm talking to somebody, like having the wherewithal of paying attention to the thoughts that I actually have, yeah. it's all come through meditation and let alone the recharge and everything else that you can pull back. So I'm a, like a high pace salesperson or I'm a, I'm a proud business person. I don't want to learn meditation and next thing I know I'm going to be eating tofu and doing all that Tofu's stuff gross. that I don't want to do, right? So where do I go where I can learn meditation and it just be about recharging and not all the other stuff. Do you, is there like a CD you I should buy? Nope, you're, you're, no, sorry, too bad, too late. Too bad? No, not for no, me then. Not for you. If you, if you say Shut. that, me okay, so, but, but that's the point, right? So, so many people have this negative connotation about meditation. Literally, at the very beginning, I was like trying to lay down on the bed and not think because I couldn't. I was like, please, I just need to stop being human for a little while. That's, that's what I started with. Um, that's not what I recommend to people now. <laughs> <laughs> there is an app called Headspace or an app called Calm, which is no woo-woo involved in any of these things. Because I, I work with a lot of seven-figure business owners, and I'm like, you should meditate. <laughs> Some of them are like, okay, crazy lady. Thinking, Did I hire the right coach? Right. <laughs> so, but that's the funny thing. Thankfully, I have science and stuff to back this stuff up. Um, I mean, you even have the book over here, Stealing Fire, about getting into the flow state, right? And you can tap into that way better when you're actually focused and you can actually control some of these thoughts and craziness that goes on in your head. I'm super impressed you saw that book. Oh, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm paying attention to everything because I meditate. That's <laughs> right. It's, it's the clarity of space that allowed me to relax before but, I came So, here. But this is the thing. So when I talk to somebody who is resistant to meditation, because there are a lot of you out there. Um, 
I can I can go through and talk uh, you, if, when you download Headspace they actually will go through the scientific studies of what it will help you with right so even relaxation I stress all that stuff science hashtag science okay yeah. but um, because we're so averse to it and because we don't think it'll work literally they'll do it for like three days and be like meh right or oh blah, whatever it was really hard right but the commitment to it really does matter so Headspace I think walks you through like a seven to ten day thing. And I make, I tell my clients what to do really, I make them commit to at least seven days yeah. because you won't be able to see, I mean, you, not that you can find the results, it's about the practice supposedly anyway, yeah. but um, at the end of that, I've had so many clients be like, oh, like I understand. One of the guys that I had coached for almost two years, he went from making $500 a month, right? Yeah. His business was over 1.2 million last year in maybe two and a half years-ish. When he hit his million, I set him a meditation bench because throughout the journey, we all we kept talking about was like, okay, because entrepreneurship is such a mind game. Being an introvert is a mind game. You're talking yourself down this spiral. Yeah. And if you can stop yourself from talking yourself down that gosh darn spiral, yeah. then you will be so much better off. I totally agree. And that's what I've had to do. And it was all meditation. So. <laughs> yeah, so it had nothing to do. Just so you know, Jamie doesn't coach anything but meditation. Don't read that's his book, just <laughs> meditate. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So, uh, look, I agree with you. I was playing devil's advocate, but I actually oh, went me. to a seven-day meditation retreat, and it was amazing. And I practice walking meditation all the time. So I, I vouch, like, any time I'm feeling anxious or I feel like I've lost control, and as an introvert, mm -hmm. I'm always judging myself. I do some meditation, and all of a sudden, I realize that I'm really focused on stuff that doesn't matter. And it makes such a difference because all of a sudden, I can go back to that creative space I needed to be in. So I'm, I'm totally with you. Well, now I get to ask my awkward question. Mm -hmm. So we, I was just on your show. You asked me the awkward question I wasn't expecting. And this is well, it's not an awkward question. This is your chance to brag. So every person I have on this show, I ask their question because we're so fixated on introversion being a disadvantage. Uh -huh. And for me, I'm like, be empowered about being an introvert. So what do you consider your introvert's edge? Of all the skills that you have, what would you consider the one thing that's really allowed you to create the success that you've created in your life? Okay, I'm going on a quick tangent because my little prep shtick at the beginning is to tell people what that question is so they don't look like a deer in headlights. <laughs> No, I, not that I Well, you know, I did talk. email it to you, but you oh, crap. Did you <laughs> say that? <laughs> okay, but that's sure. totally true. Never mind. <laughs> oh, well, I have it all prepared right here for you. No. Uh, so, so to me, I really feel like the level of connection that we can get with people, because um, to me, an extrovert, and I know some of them, are, I feel like some of the times it's like disingenuous. I mean, and this isn't, this is an overarching statement for sure, but I love deep connection. I love learning about what really motivates you and drives you. And I will go through the connection threads or the small talk or whatever it is to get to those but I care about real connection yeah. and I think that's what people really actually feel the reason why I have so many friends is because I actually care about them I'm not looking for what they can do for me right I'm going oh, how can I help I love you you're amazing and I've even been told I'm not discerning enough <laughs> right yeah. because I'm like oh, but I, I see the good in them and I want to just keep going deeper and deeper and see if I can I can really make that connection more important because being here on this earth, there's only so many things that really, really drive me as a human being and probably a lot of others. Yeah. And connection is a huge piece of it. So being able to find that and go deeper with real human beings that I actually really enjoy yeah. is huge. Well, I, th I think that's a real superpower in a lot of ways. I mean, for me, I know that I had a real barrier to showing people my real self growing up. And it actually meant I had Really, I had shallow relationships because I didn't share myself. And one of the things I noticed when I met you is I got the impression that you really cared about the answers the, to the questions as opposed to you just following the motions. And I've seen that in all the relationships you have. They're really strong. And a lot of people think that introverts can have a few really strong relationships, but they can't have a wide and deep relationship. And I think that you prove every day that that's not the case. So I, I think that's a really powerful thing that you have. So thank you for sharing that. Well, and let me clarify too, because my low, my network of who I actually talk to on a regular basis, extremely deep, like best, best friends, is really small. That doesn't mean that I don't want to create connections with other people. It doesn't mean I talk to them all the time. But when I do, this is why I had so many people be like, I feel like we're like best friends. Or I like, you know all my secrets. I'm like, I just ask you questions. I'm just, you, I'm just, I just want to get a deeper level of connection. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it feels like I have so many friends, even when I don't necessarily chat with a lot of them, yeah. right? Uh, but because it's that level of connection, and that's what I would much rather have anyway. Not that I have to talk to everybody all the time, but the fact that I can, and I can go on a way deeper level than just that surface level stuff, I think makes all the difference in the world.
Well, and I think that just seeing the fact that you've, you know that that's putting yourself at risk because you're sharing a lot of stuff about yourself as well, but you're okay with that because the reward is better than the risk. Uh, it, it overwhelms the risk. And I think that's, that's a really powerful thing that you share in your relationships. And, and it is, it's probably a large amount of what got you where you are today. So Jamie, I've really loved having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for having me. And for everybody that's watching, I really appreciate you sharing this time with us. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Cheers. I'm on a mission to empower introverts, to be proud of who we are. Introverts have had to deal with the stigma that we just can't be as successful in business or in sales as our extroverted counterparts. We're different and we need to embrace that. I instinctively shied away from sales. I didn't want to be a salesperson. My closing ratio has gone from 15% up to close to 80%. We nearly quadrupled the number of meetings set with clients. Your book was a great revelation to me about me. I've been fortunate to receive some endorsements from some exceptional introverts. They've shared with me how much they resonated with the stories of these real people and how they transformed to being sales masters. It talks about the things that make an introvert successful. Every book was written for extroverts and there needed to be something for us. Get your copy of The Introvert's Edge today.